It's now my pleasure to introduce um, Leonie Bell. The research that Leonie will present to us today was her award-winning entry for the annual Ron Rathbone Local History Competition. Leonie has won this competition three times now because she is an excellent researcher and writer. Um, Leonie is also a member of the Institute of Australian Tour Guides and does tours at the Opera House when tourists and COVID allow. Um, and she's also an active member of the Botany Bay Family History Society. So I think I'll hand over to Leonie now. Um, thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you for the invitation, Alison. I'm just going to share some slides here with everyone. And uh, if you just let me know that you can see the slideshow there. Yes, we can see that. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So today I'm going to tell you the story of a fascinating building. It has quite a varied history and it's had a couple of different names over the last century or so. So we're going to discover who built it, who lived there and how it's changed over the century. So it started life as a family home, then it moved on to be an industrial school for girls, and finally today it's a retirement village. So let's start with family home. Now, I should mention to start with that the manager of the building tells me that emphatically the name is pronounced Tepito. However, a former resident told me it was pronounced Tepito, so I leave it up to you to uh, de uh, decide there. So here we are at uh, the Pedo in 1885. Oh, I'm getting something strange on my screen here, Alison. Somebody's requesting remote control of my screen. Don't um. know what that is. Yes. Okay, the Pedo was built in 1885 by Frederick John Gibbons. He was a wealthy oyster merchant. And it's declassified this house under the Heritage Act of 1977. Of course, today it's very much surrounded by suburban houses, but that wasn't always the case. It was once really the focal point of uh, the area, sitting on the top of a hill in a large estate, a beloved family home. And it was an obvious choice uh, for its location at the time. Wollongong Road was the main thoroughfare to the Iron Creek area. Now, Frederick John Gibbons was the eldest son of ex-convict John Gibbons and freeborn Anne Meredith, and the Aboriginal name of his birthplace, Dapto, was supposedly Dapeto or Dabpeto, and, you know, that's where the weird name comes from. It's supposed to mean water plenty in the Darable language. So Frederick Gibbons became an oyster farmer. So originally the colonists had been just hand collecting oysters from the, the shores until they managed to out overfish the area and then the government introduced a leasing system. So he got some leases in the Hunter River in 1873. Uh, but he was more than just a farmer. He was an entrepreneurial businessman. So he sold his own oysters but also those of others on commission uh, to uh, the various oyster saloons that featured in Sydney at the time. There were about 20 of them. A lot of them clustered around the King Street area. So oysters were pretty much poor man's food in this era. And he had offices in Sussex Street. So over the next few years, he expanded quite a bit. He took on more and more leases. He eventually acquired 73 oyster leases on a number of rivers, the Hunter, the Bellinger, the Nambucca, Camden Haven. So he really was monopolising industry. He was living in Kent Street, but he decided to build his dream home in Wollongong, <laughs> on Wollongong Road in Arncliffe. And uh, it was originally built on a land that was given as a Crown land grant to Thomas Hill Bardwell in 1853. And then part of that land grant was sold to George Pinkable Sal in 1879. And he sold a small portion of that to Frederick John Gibbons in 1881. However, Gibbons didn't actually start developing the site until 1885. So if you're a visitor at the time, you would be uh, moving up the driveway there to the house and you'd ring on this lovely little ornate doorbell and then you would approach these beautiful glass panel entrance doors. Now, of course, they wouldn't have had the little ramp back then. Uh, so you would then be progressing into the main hallway, a cedar staircase rising up to the second storey, 
lovely plaster roses in the ceiling and, of course, you've got gas lighting there and linoleum floors. So patterned linoleum was very much in, but he also had a lot of Brussels and Axminster rugs, so quite expensive uh, flooring. And he began to furnish this property with quite expensive and exclusive furniture, a lot of it imported from London. Now, here we have a beautiful interior. The visitors might have noticed the little Chippendale table there. Uh, there's a walnut cabinet filled with a lot of ornaments and uh, nice artworks hanging from the ceiling and little potted plants. A very lovely, uh, friendly uh, family um, gathering place for the piano. So very nice photo there. And then in the morning, the family would start the day with breakfast in the breakfast room. It was a big table, nine-foot oak table, and the food would be served from the uh, sideboard at the back there. And on chilly winter mornings, you'd have the log fires in the um, fireplace on the left there. And on the top of the fireplace, you can see some rather expensive Parisian marble clocks and Honiton, Sevres and Dresden bone china. So you can see he had quite expensive taste. Now, then they would also have the formal dining room. That was a massive 18-foot oak table, and they had to have such a big table because he had a large family. He had nine children eventually, and he also liked to host a lot of social and dinner parties. Now, heading upstairs, of course, uh, you wouldn't have had plumbing back in those days. They did have a water supply to the house from a, uh, a windmill. Uh, it was in Lorraine Street, or now Firth Street. But, of course, you would have been using a jug and a you know, pitcher in order to wash yourself. But the bedroom furniture was all carved from American walnut, cedar and maple. Maple, sorry. And each of the eight bedrooms was furnished with a timber or an iron bedspread, a wardrobe, a pedestal cupboard, a dressing table and the washstand, of course. Now, the Gibbons were great gardeners. They loved gardening, particularly their fern house. And you can imagine the family sitting on the veranda there surveying the uh, 12 acres of lawn, which was all mowed by hand. Remember the old iron rollers? So you can take pity on their poor gardener who had to mow 12 acres with an iron roller. Um, if they were feeling energetic, perhaps they might play a game of tennis at their own personal tennis court. They might go down and pick a little bit of fruit from the orchard, perhaps go for a ride from their stables. Or they might even climb the spiral staircase up to the roof. There was a little captain's lookout and you could see Botany Bay from the uh, top there. Now, they entered a lot of uh, gardening competitions. This one was held at Sables Hotel in Brighton. And I believe this is probably Catherine and her daughter, Emma, who would have been 20 years old at that point. They have a lovely display of waratahs and nice palms. You can see there from their palm house and it was all backed with a lush velvet red curtain. Uh, however, it was actually her vegetables that won the prize for this particular flower show. They love to entertain, and Frederick Gibbons celebrated his 50th uh, birthday in style in 1891. He had 60 guests, they had a dance and a dinner, very nice. And, of course, each of his daughters celebrated their wedding at the house. Frederick's daughter, Amy, married accountant William Tom from Glasgow. And then we also had Frederick's daughter, Ada, who was married at Depetto in New Year's Day 1907 to a local man called uh, David George Stead. Now, Frederick probably met his son-in-law through business dealings because Stead was on the um, manager of the state trawlers undertaking and Gibbons was on the oyster uh, representative for the fisheries board. And you might not know of Stead particularly, but he did have a young daughter, Christina, from a previous marriage and she would become a famous novelist in the 30s and 40s, Christina said. And Frederick actually owned Lydham Hall, and he gave uh, Lydham Hall as a home for the couple. The hall itself was built in 1860 by a wealthy butcher and landowner, Joseph Davies. It was a two-acre block in Bexley, and Davies' widow sold it to Gibbons in 1899, and he leased it to various tenants before giving it to his daughter. After his death, it was sold in 1917, £2,885 and then purchased later in the 1970 by Rockpile Council. I'm sure some of you would have been there to visit it. It's now a museum. So as the new century dawned, all the big estates surrounding Capetto were rapidly subdivided. It was desirable for families wanting to escape the, uh, you know, the dust and the dirt and the hustle and bustle of Sydney. 
And, of course, we've got nearby Belmont House on Wollongong Road to the west of Depetto. That was subdivided and sold in 1905. And Fairview Estate was sold two years later. Frederick and Catherine celebrated their golden wedding anniversary in May 1914, but three years later he was admitted to the Jenna Hospital in Potts Point and he died there in February 1917. He was aged 75. And his wife Catherine survived him, passing away in January 1929. He had a very long and complicated will. Basically, Frederick wanted his business empire of the oysters to remain intact as a legacy so that he would be able to support his family, his wife and family, for the rest of their days. And he specifically says in his will that he wants his money to remain invested in the oyster industry after his death and the proceeds, the profits, would go towards the family. So his executors were his son-in-law, William Todd, and his daughter, Emma Patterson, and they had quite extensive powers to administer this estate as they saw fit. So Depetto itself uh, and most of the furniture and the surrounding property was to be sold and the money held in trust. And from this trust fund, the will stated that Catherine should be bought a house and receive an income and she could take as much of the furniture as she wanted. You think about it, an eight-bedroom, eight two-storey house on a 12 acres, really a bit too much for one person because the family by then were all growing up. So the first sale of 54 allotments were auctioned in 1917, and this included the house and a subdivision of plots you can see there fronting Wollongong Road and also the ones at the back there fronting Parliament Terrace. Now, his total assets were £26,000, so a lot of money, and the estate was valued, the Geppetto itself was valued for death duties at £6,700. Although total sales from the first auction actually amounted to 5325 Now, the family now had a large sum of money to pay death duties, which would have been substantial. The house and five plots were sold to the Salvation Army for £2,200, just under two acres, and this was quite a small portion of the original 12-acre Gibbons estate, which had formed an even smaller part of Bardwell's 61-acre land grant. Later on, the Army also bought us another uh, plot of land next door. So Frederick's will gave William Tom the specific right to subdivide the land into housing plots if he chose to and to create any necessary roads that he would need. So they extended Fairview Street and then the second auction was handled of the remaining plots. Now this was handled in family with the son-in-law William Tom handling the actual sale and his brother, uh, solicitor John Stuart Tom, handling the legalities. If you go into Fairview Street today, you'll see a lot of California bungalow-style houses and just behind Macquarie Lodge. So its next stage was a girls' home. When the Salvation Army purchased it, their intention was to open an industrial girls' school. And at that time, the army across the, um, the Eastern Division was caring for 1,300 boys and girls in 11 homes. So it has been suggested that this particular ministry began the year before DePetto came to market, presumably in rented property, possibly in uh, Burwood, while another army source did indicate that it may have even commenced as early as 1912, but I haven't been able to find any further evidence to this. I just the one brief reference. So if you look at the official records on the government website Find and Connect, which is aimed at uh, children who were fostered or put in homes, um, they say that the original name of the Uncliffe home was not changed to the Nest Children's Home until 1930, but it is shown on the second DePetto estate map as that, uh, the Nest, right from the early days, and newspaper reports do corroborate this. So why was it called the Nest? Well, there were lots of uh, Salvation Army homes for children across the world that were named the Nest internationally, and, you know, I think it's a reflection of the Army's attitude to looking after children. If they wanted it to be a home, a place of... Um, respite and, you know, a care for the children, which could often, you know, differ from the judicial view of treating children as almost criminals in a way. So they wanted to protect the children in their homes. Originally there was intended to be an age restriction for admission of 10 to 14 years, but, you know, a lot of the girls had sisters and, as you can see from this, uh, where they're lined up in order of height, 
Uh, they had kids as young as three years old there. So uh, by 1934, there were over a 1,000 girls passed through the doors and the reasons for them going into the industrial school could be quite varied. Some were orphans, others had, were deserted women or widows of either sex, actually, who just simply couldn't care for their children anymore. You've got to remember that if you were out of work, there was no money, there was no doll in this period. So financial stress could be a big issue. And there could also be things like mental illness, alcoholism, and uh, physical or sexual abuse in the home. There could have been a lot of reasons. And also we had children who were made wards of the state and they would have been directed to the home by the courts. So when this photo was published in 1921, the nest was catering for 60 girls, uh, one of seven Eastern Division homes for the Salvation Army, who were then housing a total of 400 children. Uh, the nest admitted 162 girls that year and passed on another 175 to friends or situations. Now, you can see that they had a little school there to the left of the pedo, just uh, to the top of the house there, and also the dining room, which was now the Rollers, is on the side here, and uh, there's a playroom just behind the marquee. So industrial schools were based on the... Let me see if it'll change slides. There we go. Industrial schools were based on the British model and the Industrial Schools Act for the Relief of Destitute Children was introduced into Australia in 1886, providing for the creation of industrial schools to which children under the age of 16 who were deemed at risk could be sent by orders of two justices of the peace until their 18th birthday. Now, the school superintendent was responsible for feeding them, housing them, clothing them, educating them, and also for their religious instruction. He had a lot of power or she had a lot of power. They could make any rules that they thought necessary and they would have been considered quite harsh in many of the homes by today's standards. Now, it was intended as a place of tuition for neglected children, but um, it was not intended as a reformatory. But quite often the, the line between the two became rather blurred. Uh, Find and Connect suggests that it was expressly set up to care for and educate young girls who've fallen afoul of the law. Well, if you had three-year-olds there, clearly they hadn't really fallen afoul of the law. They weren't criminals. Um, if I can paraphrase the Industrial Schools Act, it basically applies to um, children whose parents were unemployed. Um, kids today, we would call them homeless street kids. Uh, they were surviving as best they could by scrounging or by stealing. Uh, they could take you uh, kids away if they were uh, the children of thieves or the children of prostitutes or they were wandering around the streets. So it was pretty broad as to why you could end up in an industrial school. So what was life like there at the nest? Well, an early visitor in 1918 was pretty impressed and he said, uh, had I not been told what this institution was, I would have thought it was a, a school for very high-class young girls. The Army appointed officers to administer and staff the institution and they all wear these little aprils for his sake, um, it's just reminding them of their religious duty towards the children. Uh, the first matron was Commandant Horsley and she was assisted by adjutants Walter Barnes and Lieutenants Halston, Hopper and Blackmore. Now, in all Salvation Army homes, uh, the commanding officers would change regularly and, in fact, also in the, in the core, the churches, and they would move from post to post. Matron Merrifield was in charge in the mid-20s. She was described as a true mother and homemaker with a delightful sense and fund of humour, common sense, sympathy and understanding. And the children did regard her as a second mother. And there's a great little story about uh, Matron Merrifield had to inform two young girls that their father had died. So she brings them into her office and, you know, tries to sympathetically tell them that their father's died. And afterwards, she gives them a piece of fruit and then she sends them out to play. So the kids go outside and go, hey, my dad's gone to heaven and mum just gave us this piece of fruit. So the next thing you know, little kid comes back into the office, another little kid says, hey, mum, my father died tonight. So wanting a piece of fruit as well. So um, I don't know how well the message was conveyed there. In the 1950s, they wore house uniforms with a straw boater hat whenever they attended church at Rockdale Corps. But at other times, unless they were um, required to wear a school uniform, they just wore ordinary clothes. Now, you might think perhaps wearing uniforms is a little bit over-regimented, but of course it creates a sense of identity. And also it's very egalitarian because these kids, a lot of them would have been extremely poor and they might not have had great clothing. So it just sort of evened out. Um, the uh, status between the kids. Now, they were accommodated in 17 clean and airy dormitories. 
they rose at 7 o'clock in the morning and then they went down to the washroom. They would have a little um, keg on the wall with their name on it, a little bag with their, their brush and their comb and their washing things. Then they would go and take a bath in the big iron bathtubs and then they would uh, have to go to breakfast at 7.30 and they had big long tables in the dining room. They had three meals a day. They were provided by the staff. They were cooked on a big iron range. After breakfast, communal morning prayers. Now, remember that the nesties were considered part of a family and as a part of a family, you were expected to do your duty and your rostered jobs. And so they were inculcated with this strong personal ethic, so-called Protestant ethic, and they would have to make their beds each morning. They would have to do chores like helping make the sandwiches for everybody's school lunch, perhaps doing the washing up of the dishes and, of course, polishing the uh, tiles, scrubbing the tiles down on the porch. The tiles are still there, so they must have done a good job. Now, they were also taught um, things like sewing. Uh, the nests had a very pragmatic, practical attitude to it. I quote an army publication. It was to be a structure for which the young are trained for the larger sphere, which will claim them at an early date. Now, remember that the larger sphere in that period would have been wives and mothers, and these kids wouldn't have had necessarily mothers that could show them how to do things like housework and sewing and cooking. Uh, they would also be working if they were of a working class, and pretty much all the jobs available to women in the days were domestic duties. So although, you know, seems a bit tough these days, don't judge it too harshly, they were actually preparing them for things in life that were considered pretty important at the time. One of the legal requirements was they had to send them to school, so they actually built a two-story, uh, two-room a prefab building in the corner of the property called the Wilsons Road School, and uh, they would all go down there every day. Eventually, uh, they took on some overflow students from nearby Athelstane Public School, but eventually the education department actually expanded Athelstane and all the girls and all the other students went back to Athelstane and the Wilsons Road School was closed. Uh, it wasn't all work and no play. They would get story time, there'd be birthday celebrations, Saturday afternoons, the mothers would come and visit them on the lawn. Uh, they also did a lot of outdoor recreation. They were very fortunate, actually, because the highlight of the year was the annual camp um, at Collaroy. Now, the Collaroy Youth Camp is still there. It'd be a bit different today. But they would get two weeks holiday along with the um, boys from the Bexley Boys Home nearby. And uh, that's pretty uh, unique, I would have thought, amongst industrial schools. Um, these camps carried on right through from 1917 to the 1960s. Uh, they would also be doing physical culture. You can see here Yuronga. The matron, Merrifield, also was matron at Yuronga for one time, so it probably would have been quite similar things. So the kids would be then playing outdoors after school and then the dinner bell would ring at five, then there'd be after-dinner prayers, and then they'd go to bed between seven and eight to eight o'clock, depending on the age of the child. Now, Christmas was always a, a great time of celebration. The staff would really try to make it a great family occasion, and Santa would come in, and, yes, he would literally drop in from above. One year, one year they had him on the roof, and he had this great big bunch of balloons. He had supposedly flown in from the North Pole with the balloons, and, of course, actually what he'd done was climbed up this little tiny little staircase up to the uh, captain's nest. It was financed through don donations and fundraising, such as the annual fate. Now, that has continued right up till today. Uh, of course, it's been a bit deferred by COVID. But sometimes a generous donor would give them money so they could take them on an excursion to somewhere like Taronga Zoo. Sometimes they'd go to Cars Park for a swim and a picnic. Uh, and then there would be other donations you marked for more practical considerations like eating. Now, many of the girls were actively involved in the Salvation Army, but they weren't all Salvationists. They came from many different denominations. It was compulsory to go to church on Sunday at the Army at Rockdale, but uh, a couple of the kids actually went on to become Salvation Army officers. Quite a few held non-officer um, non positions, like local officer positions at the local corps as well. Music was very important to them, and uh, Commandant Horsley formed the girls into a choir and this was called the Nest Girls Company. It toured all over the place. It went up to the Hunter Valley. It went down to the Illawarra region, went out west. They were very, very popular. They were basically doing Christian variety shows. And, of course, you can see here during World War One, throes of patriotism. They're all wearing little flags there. But they were very popular shows. 
And I rather like this little photo of the nest girls that appeared in quite a few army publications. But despite the popularity of the concerts by the late 20s, they were becoming less frequent and they completely petered out so that the girls would just come and do a night in here and there, perhaps a, a visit to a hospital or a corps or a special event. So by the 30s, no more big tours because, look, these things require the dedication and passion of one particular person and it takes a lot of organisation to send girls off on tours, to rehearse them all the time. And Salvation Army Officer postings were very short. They could be six or 12 months, maybe two years, and you can imagine that the staff would have moved on and different staff would have different priorities. So it made the continuation of the tours a little bit more difficult. But you can see some of the instruments they're playing there, the handbells, mandolins, drums, and they would also do musical culture displays as part of this. Now, most prestigious visitor ever, General Evangeline Booth, the founder's daughter, founder of the Salvation Army, was William Booth, of course. And she came out to visit Australia in 1935. Very big excitement. She came by train to Central. There were great crowds to, to greet her. And then there was spontaneous hymn singing at Central Station, if you could imagine. And then they popped her in the car and she went down to the nest. And that's where she stayed while she was on the Sydney part of her tour. Now, the uh, interesting uh, presentation of the kids presented it with a kangaroo. A little ribbon wire tied around its neck, and she was very gracious. She said, "Well, I'll try and take it back with me to London." <laughs> I don't think that was going to be very possible. Okay, uh, not the only visit general to visit. General Kitching also visited a couple of decades later, and we also had a lot of senior officers with a, a big connection to the house. The um, the commissioners would always come down Sundays. They would be preaching. They would be visiting. They'd come down as guests on Christmas Day and uh, the big fates, of course. So they saw quite a bit of army life. However, during the war, people began to worry about Sydney being invaded and a lot of kids were actually evacuated to country towns, including the girls from the nest. And they were sent to Canoundra from 1942 to 1945. Now, I have not been able to ascertain whether the girls actually were sent back to Sydney or whether they had a new batch of girls admitted to, um, to Pedo at that period. I can't find out that sort of information quite simply because there are privacy issues with records and children's homes records are embargoed for 100 years. So unless you're a family member and requesting specific information, people like myself simply can't find this information out. So they went to a Canoundra and then later on, 1945, the home reopened again. A lot of change in the 50s. State governments were becoming increasingly reluctant to fund children's homes. There were policies emerging more in favour of things like fostering and a lot of institutions changed and closed and eventually that would affect the nest as well. So Mr Rathbone, many of you would know Ron, uh, looking a bit young there. So in 1964, uh, 17 self-contained retirement units were built on the site and so it was cohabited by young and old and Ron Rathbone was at the fate that year to open it and he noted that this was the first privately run aged care facility of its type in the Rockdown Municipal Area. 1968, at the fate, Commissioner Scotney announced that they were going to move the girls temporarily and then by January of 1969 it was decided the girls would go permanently to the uh, lodge at Stanmore and then they closed the industrial school life of this particular site. So it's unknown how many girls passed through the doors of the nest and I'm clear. As I said before, admission records aren't available to me, so I can't do any statistics. Even if I could get hold of the records, it's probable that they wouldn't be accurate. Um, it's impossible to know how many Australian children were placed in care over the last century, not just in the Salvation Army, but across the whole of the institutions nationally. Records were often not kept or not kept well, or they were kept in different formats. And believe it or not, the government doesn't even know how many orphanages existed in this period. So if it's by the 2004 Senate Community Affairs Reference Committee to work this all out, uh, suggest that maybe half a million children were placed in care in the 19th and 20th centuries, a vague estimate of possibly 200,000 in New South Wales, possibly 330,000 children came under the care of the Salvation Army between 1950 and 1979, but they can't be more precise. So... 
Times have changed. Okay, now it was starting to become a fully fledged retirement home. They wanted to make it three tiers, so they already had Philip House, and then with the children relocated, they didn't leave the lawns anymore, so they started to build new buildings. 26, uh, 46 two-storey units were built uh, the following year, and that was James Cook Place, and then there was a 67-bed nursing home called Macquarie Lodge located behind the pedo. Third stage was planned for 36 units and 51 single hostel rooms in a resident built to the east of the nursing home. And the architects, Stevenson and Turner, were very anxious to harmonise the new buildings with the old. Now, I think looking at this photo, it's pretty debatable whether that harmony was achieved. So the reason it's pale brick is because the pedo is built of pale brick that's infused with whale oil to keep out the damp. And the bay windows are supposed to reflect the bay windows in the pedo. Hmm. Well, I don't know, maybe it looked better in the 60s, but <laughs> they're still there. They have been refurbished inside in recent times. So as part of this redevelopment, it was necessary to demolish the rear wing of the pedo building, which had housed the kitchen, laundry and servants' accommodation. And there you can see Macquarie Lodge uh, is a new name for the pedo. So the final stage was opened in October 1971 by Sir Roby Cutler, the, the governor, and dedicated by Commissioner Hubert Scotton. He was the territorial commander. So they now said that they had 230 people's accommodation and a depeto itself was housing the communal facilities. So a DA was lodged with Rockdale Council in December 2006 and in August 2007 the Salvation Army uh, announced a major initiative for the retirement home and they wanted to tear down and replace the original ageing units behind the pedo, not the pale ones, the, the original red brick ones from the 60s, and they were going to spend $2 million on refurbishing the Depetto itself because it was now 122 years old. Lots of um, heritage orders, of course, and aged care regulations and planning control. But the council and the heritage people were very, very supportive of the idea. And uh, the interesting thing is that when you, know, when you put something on a national register, it's not just about the fabric of the building. It's also about its actual function over an extended period of time. So, therefore, you can make changes to structures with heritage orders without necessarily violating them because the 2007 report from the Manager of Urban Planning states that the Heritage Council, uh, the heritage significance of the site relates to its ability to demonstrate historic patterns of development within the surrounding areas and for its ongoing association with and ability to demonstrate the social work of the Salvation Army since 1917. The overall significance of Depetto can be retained by achieving a careful balance between the loss of setting and the intensification of built-up area on site and that the proposed development will not only retain but enhance the heritage significance of the site by allowing for the retention of the use by the Salvation Army. So I don't think you could have asked for a more positive um, uh, endorsement there. Of course, it wasn't plain sailing. There were still lots of things to go through. But here we have Macquarie Lodge today. And uh, it's quite an extensive property. You can see uh, lots of new buildings in, built in recent years, sort of in the, um, the final development application for Stage 2 was submitted November 2010, and Macquarie Lodge advertised the opening of its new aged care wing in June 2012 with high care, low care and dementia beds, plus 49 refurbished independent living units. So they'd be the ones out the back there. And it was now part of the aged care class division of the Salvation Army's Eastern Territory. The Eastern Territory united with the Southern Territory in 2019. So now aged care plus is an Australia-wide um, operation. They have um, 20 residential aged care centres, seven retirement villages, a respite centre, and a variety of services for home and community care. As you can see, uh, the building is actually in great state of con uh, conservation. Uh, it has excellent sight lines from the street, unlike uh, many of the other buildings on the road there. Uh, that does extend right out to the end of the property, of course, but, you know, nobody these days from the big estates um, has has the full <laughs> full uh, gardens that they used to have 100 years ago, so that's pretty normal. Having a look inside, if you've never been inside, it's an absolutely beautiful structure. They've got this great classic look, but it's not sort of dull and dingy. It's got light and airy colourings to it, really lovely original furnishings. And you can see here uh, the original um, fireplaces. You saw some of them in the early black and white photos and now they've been retained, of course. 
So a lot of the furniture was sold off, but this is all built in. So beautiful furniture. So they've been able to add to and to modify the retirement village and offer new aged care services without compromising the heritage value. And, of course, the use of the site as a children's home in 1917, that was a very early use of adaptation, although nobody had heard that word before uh, then. So they have a clear extension of the uh, purpose of the site in the provision of social services, which the Salvation Army has now been doing at this location for 105 years, which is pretty extraordinary. So it's a much longer year time frame than the 32 years it's spent as a family home. So in conclusion, it's been a varied use, but in all stages it has been about family life, whether uh, for a gentleman's residence and his family, whether looking after the orphaned and neglected children, and then, of course, today looking after the elderly. So do have a hard copy available if you want to read the full thing. It's about 100 pages. Uh, there's one in the Rockdale Library. You can't borrow it. It's in the reference. Um, the Salvation Army Museum and Dexin Orf also has a copy. And, of course, Bayside have put the copies online if you would like to read it there. So I had some great help from this from Kirsten at the library at Rockdale, Dawn at the museum, and uh, Macquarie Lodge manager who's very kind to let me in and take some photos. So now it is question time and I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you, Leonie. That was really fascinating. I was so good to hear not only the uses of the house, but also the lives of the children and the people that lived there. So thank you for illuminating us and bringing those um, uh, windows and doors and floorboards to life a little bit more. I don't think there are any questions in the chat so far. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Kelsey if she can unmute people so that people can ask um, questions directly if they'd like to. Yeah, people well, I, might to start, I might start by actually um, addressing some of the questions that were put on the Facebook page and then that might answer a few things that people might be thinking about. Okay, so I was asked what had triggered the research. Well, it's kind of uh, connected to the next question, which he asked us, do I consider visual arts such as paintings, promotional posters, portraits and landscapes as a true source of information? Well, actually, it was photos that got me going on this in the first place. I discovered the beautiful photos, the black and white photos, in the collection at Bayside Libraries, and that really got me interested. Of course, at the time, I didn't know where the research would end me. Uh, uh, you know, that's part of the fun of researching. But I do think that uh, things such as the sales posters for the subdivisions are really illuminating. I, I showed you a couple of those there. And just looking at paintings and, and sketches, they give you a, an idea of what these areas would have looked like. And, of course, we know there's a little bit of artistic licence, but you are comparing multiple sources of information. So you, you know, have to evaluate it in one, one with that. Now, it took me about a year on and off. I wasn't doing it constantly to do this. Uh, I was asked how challenging, what was the most challenging thing? Timelines are actually really challenging because you're putting information from the council minutes, from the development applications, from the war cry, from the newspapers and trove, and try to figure out what happened when, in which order, can be actually a little bit tricky sometimes. And sometimes they conflict and you've got to do a little bit of thinking before you make a decision. Maybe somebody else will come to a slightly different decision if they were looking at the information as well, but you never know. Um, I was also asked, did the owner plan to establish a small museum? Well, they don't need to because you might not be aware there's a wonderful little Salvation Army Museum in Barnsbury Grove at Bexley North, and it's open Monday to Friday and the occasional Saturday from 9 till 2, and I had a lot of help from the museum. They gave me so quite a few photos and things. And I monopolised their computer there for months, actually. I was researching the war cries, so they have all the war cries on record. But it's a really nice little museum. So it's not specifically aimed at the pedo, but it has some great information about Salvation Army life and some wonderful items in that collection there. Um, another question, does the owner plan to make changes in the heritage listing? I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. Are they going to make a blue plaque? I have no idea. I doubt it. I think the Salvation Army, although they have a really active historical society, um, you know, the Salvation Army's got a lot more on their minds, probably floods at the moment. Um, so I don't know whether they would be interested in 
pursuing changes to the, the order or to the blue plaques. Um, question that probably is on the t minds of a few people is, was there any abuse at this home? Now, I read the report from the 2004 Senate uh, Committee on Forgotten Australians and I also read the report for the 2014 Royal Commission into Sex Abuse. The pedo was not mentioned in any of them. Um, they did mention a couple of Salvation Army homes and unfortunately the nearby Bexley Boys home was um, implicated and there were a few people went to jail over that. But there was no indication at all. There were newspaper reports where people were interviewed who lived there and they said they had a wonderful time. And I also had the privilege of speaking with a former resident who had lived there from the age of 5 to 13 and she told me it was a wonderful place. She had a terrific time in her youth. She said, yes, the discipline was strict but it was normal for the time. You know, children's behaviour was quite different back then anyway. So she said it was a wonderful place and she loved every minute. And, in fact, a lot of the ex-nesties used to meet together monthly uh, for many years and sort of petered out as they got older. But uh, they clearly uh, really had a great affection for the place. And the final question that was online was, do I plan to challenge a commonly known but incorrect understanding of the area, its development before the arrival of the railway, and a few biographical details on Gibbons? It's commonly accepted that he was facing insolvency in his last years. Well, I would dispute that he was facing insolvency, and I would say, I don't challenge it, I would challenge people to look at the documentation I went out to the state records and I had a look at the probate packet in Frederick's will. Now, yes, he did have quite a few debts, but I would, my assessment was that they were actually normal business debts. He had two business loans, as you would expect. He was a big empire. He was making a lot of money from these oysters. Um, he owed money to his doctors because he'd been sick. And most of, the, most of the things, though, apart from the two bank loans, and his doctor's bills, most of the, the bills were really under £10. So it was small fry. So uh, my point is that when you read the will, his intention was always that this estate would go on, that his business for the oysters would go on and it would be used to support his family. So, no, they didn't sell the house to pay the debts. Yes, of course, some of the money was used to pay the, the debt duties and the debts, but the reality was that was always part of the plan. And that's why he specifically gave um, his son-in-law the ability to subdivide the property. He even told him in the will, you can build roads or anything you need in order to do this. So, uh, no, I don't think he was bankrupt or they sold them to do the debts. And don't forget his widow, you know, one woman in an eight-bedroom, two-storey house and 12 acres. Not really feasible. The will actually specifies that they were to buy her a smaller house. So he already said sell the house before he died. So, any more questions that I haven't covered in all of that? Thank you, Leonie. That that's um that's great to hear some of those um questions answered. Um, there is um one other question here, more more to do with the Ron Rathbone um competition. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see it there in the chat. Yeah. Have I done anything on Indigenous history? Um, Tracy's come across a midden near the creek where she lives, and wondering if it would be a good topic to investigate. Hmm. Um, no, I haven't done anything about Indigenous history. That's certainly uh, an intriguing thought. You, you never know. <laughs> you never know what might happen. Any advice? Wow. Hmm. Any advice? You just got to look for the original documents. You know, source documents are great. It's the second. It's all very well reading secondary documents. What other people think, and you should look at that. But you need to be looking for source documents. And I, my advice would be firstly contact the Bayside Library because the local history collection, uh, both at Rockdale and at Mascot, is really good and the librarians are fantastic help. But you need to talk to them, not just look up a cattle dog. <laughs> so uh, because they know the collection really, really well. So that would be my advice. And don't be afraid to go out to state records at uh, Kingswood. They have some great stuff too, although I don't know whether it would be useful for Indigenous history as such, but uh, certainly in general go out to state archives. And, yes, Tracy. depending on which creek you're referring to and whereabouts the midden is, um, there are some, some other researchers who might be able to uh, point you in the right direction. And um, Janet's already mentioned Paul Irish. Um, Grace Carskins might be another possibility.
facility as well. Um, but we can assist you with that if you'd like to get in touch with the Bayside Local History team. Um, I can't see any other questions coming through and we are um, just over, a little bit over time. So if you do have any other questions, um, please feel free to, to get in touch with us at Bayside Libraries um, uh, or um, contact us by phone or by email. I'll just mention that next month's talk will be on Friday the 1st of August um, and it will be a presentation from Emily Jattaf, who works at the Sea Museum, which other people might know of as the Australian National Maritime Museum. Um, and she'll be talking about um, a history of uh, shipping in Botany Bay and particularly um, a move towards more green and sustainable shipping. Um, so more details to come on that, but keep Friday the 1st of April around about 1pm um, in your diaries and we'll, we'll send through some information soon. So I thank you everybody for joining us on this wet and steamy Friday. Hopefully the weather will have changed by next Friday, by another month's month away. And I hope you all have a good afternoon. And my thanks again to Leone for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Leone. Bye, everybody.